the Bible can be weaponized. Uh, yeah, that's a yes. That's an excellent way of putting it. Yes, and not not only unfortunately, it's it's not just a possibility. I mean, this is this is our reality. I think mm -hmm. people for people who interpret the Bible and people who handle the Bible, they need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. You know that this uh, this thing needs a warning label. Hello, and welcome to Great Bible Teacher Interviews. Each week I have the opportunity to speak to a biblical scholar or an author or a practitioner. We talk about the Bible or biblical interpretation or spiritual formation. This week, I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to speak with Alan Callahan. He is an independent scholar, a workshop leader, and a creative consultant who has taught biblical languages and literatures at Harvard Divinity School, has served as associate chaplain at Brown University, and as theologian in residence at Metropolitan Baptist Church in Washington, DC. He's the author of three books, two of which we will mention in our interview, and one of which I was especially interested in, called The Talking Book, African Americans and the Bible which is being taught, used in colleges and divinity schools around the country. He is also the author of over two dozen scholarly articles and has appeared as an expert commentator in documentaries from PBS, the History Channel, and the Discovery Channel. And now, here is Alan Callahan. Who has been a great Bible teacher in your life and, and what has made them a great Bible teacher for you that has shaped your, your ministry? Well, um, there are several uh, scholars of the Bible to whom I'm gratefully, greatly indebted and gratefully indebted. But the um, one that comes to mind most readily is the man who was uh, my dissertation supervisor um, during my doctoral work, a man named uh, Helmut Kuster. So he could open up a Greek New Testament and just start reading um, in shotgun Greek. You know, just it was really quite um, exhilarating, kind of watching him. It was kind of you know, if I had hair, it would be hair raising, right? Uh, he just go right through the text. Then we would come to a text and there'd be a sticking point. So, we, so, so he would open up his, his Greek New Testament and he'd just look at it and start reading the text. And he would just go and make observations as he went along. He just made observations as he went along. It was really extraordinary. Um, and it was a kind of sto uh, show stopping way of, you know, what, unpretentiously, in this case, that's just what he did. But it was a show stopping way of reading a text. And, uh, and I did ask him about it once, you know, occasionally I would kind of screw up the courage to, you know, ask him questions. And uh, he, he would say, you have to start with a reading of the text. You have to read the text. Don't do anything before you do that. So, you know, the, all of these, these uh, uh, you know, devices that you have, you know, you're, uh, the, these kind of hermeneutical bells and whistles you have at your disposal. All this stuff, basically, he was saying, all this stuff that we're teaching you, or, you know, trying to force feed you. He said, all of that has to start, so it can't start, unless and until you've read the text. Uh, and it's not enough that you read it last year, or that you read it in Sunday school, or that, uh, or even that you just read it last night. You're going to start, if you're going to do an exegesis or any kind of treatment of the text, first, read it. Start with the text in question. Don't trust your memory. Don't, don't trust your recollection. Don't trust your, um, and certainly don't trust any received notions about it. He was good for that, too. I mean, he's a guy who could have rested on his laurels and said, well, I know what this text really means. And, but when it came time to actually talk about the text itself, he never did that. He insisted on a fresh reading. Um, and it's, a, um, it's an experience 
it resonates with an experience I've had subsequently in a com completely different context uh, as a preacher. I would uh, read the text. Yeah, and this, this Helmut had taught me. I, I took that right into the pulpit with me. It was extraordinary. And the main reason was I found it extraordinary is because it never failed. I knew that text. I've grown up hearing these texts. I, you know, I grew up in church. I know that book. I know what's in there, right? Mm. I mean, I know what's in there. I mean, there's just no surprises in it. And I read a, te a text that I've read a hundred times before. Maybe I've even preached the text, so I have some pretense to actually knowing what it, what it, you know, what at least I think it means. And it it never fails. I. I, I see things I didn't see before. I, I, there's there are things that are happening in that text that uh, I used to joke in the pulpit. I said, it's, just, "It's like somebody's rewriting this thing. <laughs> this is a this is no, it's a scan. It's a scan. Somebody is rewriting it. I'm going to when I go to bed at night. Somebody works on this text. I get up in the morning. It's the same chapter, it's the same verse, but someone has messed with this text. Someone's tampered with it." And it's not the same as I thought it was. Um, even last week, even last month, uh, cer it's certainly not the same after some significant experience I've had. Mm -hmm. right? Because no, this is this in, this biblical interpretation business is is is, uh, is quite sub subjective. Mm -hmm. It's quite subjective, subjective, much more so than perhaps we're willing to admit. And uh, maybe we'll talk about that a little later. But. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, who's reading it makes a lot of difference. And then there's just some stuff that you see um, where you are today that you just didn't see 20 years ago. Mm. You, you, you couldn't see it. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, this shakes out, I think this shakes out if there's, if there's a, a, a racial or ethnic difference, this shakes out if there's a a gender difference. It shakes out this generational difference. Mm -hmm. And then on that tip, th it can be different readings from the same person. See? Mm -hmm. So uh, um, now what that's all about, I mean, we could, we could talk about it, but at least Helmut gave me, um, I think inadvertently, I think it wasn't, that wasn't his intellectual project to, you know, for me to walk, to have this takeaway. Uh, he was interested in doing other things, um, you know, with and to my mind at the time. But uh, that was my takeaway, and um, it has benefited me enormously. Wow, that's great, and I, I love the way you've put that because it's it is true that um, that um, I'm not I'm in a sense not the same person I was the first time I read this text. Uh, so even even if my uh, Bible has not changed. I have changed. And so I'm bringing whole different experiences, different lenses uh, to, the, to the text. Uh, so it should be different. The lesson should be different from one year to another, even if the text is the same, it seems. Yeah. Uh, our, our socialization in church, at least in my experience, is quite the contrary, though. Mm. See, you, you, get, you get street cred for not changing anything that you think or believe. Oh. Right? I've, I've heard people brag about this. The same God that they met bef you know, in their confirmation class is the same God that they worship today. And they're proud of it. They, say, mm -hmm. well, I have, I, they haven't changed. They haven't changed their idea of what, what's going on in the Bible, what God is doing, the world, anything. They have a, um, they're, they're solid. That was a, that was a word that was kind of current, you know, in, in, in my circles. It's okay. a person solid. That means uh, stolid maybe is a better way of putting it. A person doesn't change, is immutable, okay. is like, is inert, right? Like a gray rock or something. Yeah. And so uh, now nobody lives that way. See, even biologists tell us that organisms just don't function that way. There's some, some, something they call basic irritability. When the environment changes, they register the change. Mm. If it's alive. Right. Um, 
but you get some credit for trying to pretend it, at least in some quarters, for trying to pretend that you're a zombie. You know, mm-hmm. you look like you're alive, but you're really dead. You're not, you're not changing, you're not growing. Um, God isn't different. The, the, the scripture isn't different. That, that, that uh, still small voice is simply repeating itself like a parrot in an echo chamber. Mm-hmm. And um, that's the way it's supposed to be. Nothing is supposed to change. But that's being faithful. And um, that is not my understanding of how this thing works. Mm-hmm. I've tried that. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, I, I'm just too whatever to actually, but I tried to drink that Kool-Aid. I really tried to, to you know, to, to roll that way. Didn't work. Just didn't work. And I'm a happier camper, not trying to, to roll like that. Mm. That's, that's kind of been happening to me as well as, if I've, as I've been doing these series of interviews. Uh, because one of the things that I've wanted to do is to learn from people who have had different experiences, different um, upbringings, different uh, nationalities, different um, different Bibles that they've used, you know, like how, how they have a different interpretation oftentimes than I have. Um, And so like when it comes to say the African American perspective on interpretation, that there are things that, uh, that I just kind of have blind side, blind spots, you know, like I, I haven't seen that before, or it's like that verse never really was kind of part of my canon, but it's very important to somebody else. And I think we do that with denominations as well. You know, we know Pentecostal holiness, the, a lot more on the spirit than uh, maybe the Baptists have say, uh, but that's also true with our uh, ethnicities and, and, uh, so I wonder if you could address that. Like, what is it that some things that you see that a black interpreter of scripture sees in a passage that a white interpreter of scripture may just miss? Okay. Um, sure. Uh, but I just, I just want to um, uh, mention this before we, we go on. Mm-hmm. I, at some point, it could be, you know, um, sub rosa or off camera or whatever. I, I would like to know why you, you know, what it was that brought you to this point where you'd be interested in how other people read the Bible. Oh, I can tell you that, sure. Um, oh, yeah. How did you first, how'd you come about doing this? My first interview that I did was with Brian McLaren, and um, and it, with Brian McLaren, what he uh, one of the things he said was that what we have done in the, in the white church is kind of um, insulate ourselves so much with our own interpretation of a European uh, American interpretation that, um, that we really have missed out on seeing the full Jesus. Because if, if, if we only have our lens, then we're missing what other people are seeing of Jesus. And that, um, that, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. Not that, not that hmm. the basic orthodoxy is, is different uh, from, from person to person, but that, um, that a person who, um, if, we don't, if we don't even use race, say, if we say mm-hmm. someone from a different economic strata, um, that me as a middle class white person who's have a, had a lot of advantages in this society. Uh, you know, I read a scripture, I read a scripture of Zacchaeus say, and it's a nice scripture about this short man who, uh, you know, met Jesus, had him come to his house and they had a nice talk and, and Jesus said, you're saved. Uh, but you know, it's like, well, then he, Zacchaeus gets to go to heaven, you know, because that's what, that's what saved means. Right. And so, um, but then I interviewed uh, Lewis Brogdon, and he was talking about this Zacchaeus story as a black theologian and said, you know, this is a story of, of uh, 
there's there's a lot more going on here than what you're seeing probably uh that you you uh are seeing salvation as heaven where really made the salvation is justice and that uh that jesus is saying you know this man has found salvation and he didn't say a sinner's prayer like you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay so that's yeah. that's kind of my uh what what started i guess was eye-opening to me it was like you know looking at my commentaries and saying well, who do I have that is not a white European male? And, uh, you know, maybe I need to broaden my, my reading, my commentaries, so I can get a different picture, different pictures of God and Jesus than I'm, I've just missed out on. I see. That's, that's great. Um, may your tribe increase. <laughs> that's what i'm hoping will happen through these interviews <laughs> oh good well good I, I i am too i am too um uh i i uh, i'm going to riff a little bit more on my experience with helmet all right because it is relevant to this next point mm -hmm. um as I say, he was my dissertation advisor. And, uh, you know, he did his training, he was German, he did his training in Germany. And as, as you may know, either directly or from direct experience or indirectly, uh, you know, they have a way of doing things. You know, they have their own way of doing things. And uh, Helmut was my dissertation advisor. And basically that meant that I will go out and find a dissertation topic. I would tell it to him and he would tell me whether or not it was acceptable. And he would just slap down proposals until I came up with something he could live with. And that's what I would do. You know, it was really, it wasn't that we would sit down and talk about it. He, I'd report <laughs> on it and, he, and he'd go thumbs up or thumbs down. It was like, you know, fighting a lion in the Coliseum or something. <laughs> So, but uh, so I wrote a paper once. I was I was working on something in the Pauline epistles, which was dangerous anyway, because Helmut was a Lutheran at, from Germany. <laughs> so he knew that. I mean, even though he 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 could read a text and come up with different stuff, when it came to what Paul was saying, Luther had told everybody all that. Mm. Martin Luther had had just given every he had sent out the memo if you want to know what paul really thinks this is what it is luther's right and everybody else is wrong that's just the way it is now so i should have been you know but you know i was young i was in graduate school i was young i didn't think and you know you're in school so that's a place where you sort of have a license to do dumb stuff <laughs> and i was thinking about it i think and i was reading this this the the epistle to philemon Paul's supposed to find language. And of course, you know, this epistle is famous for being Paul's letter to a slaveholder, right? His intervention, because the slaveholder is upset with his slave, his runaway slave, it's like runaway. So Paul knows the runaway slave, and Paul's now writing a cover letter for this runaway slave to mend his relationship, sending the slave back to him. He ran away, but, you know, you're a good guy, receive that was the standard interpretation forever mm. as far as i could tell because i did homework on this for a while I mean, forever like since the fourth century this mm. has been the party line for this and uh so uh you know all european biblical exegetes and those are the only ones that count right i mean those are the only ones that matter uh they all agreed on that including martin luther so it's two o'clock in the morning. I'm working on my paper, and I'm and I'm reading this again, taking a page out of Helmut's book. I'm reading this text for the first time. I'm just sick of you. I'm just going to sit down and say, let me just read this text, see what it says. And as I read it, I thought to myself, this guy never says anything about this this Onesimus guy being a runaway. He never says that he ran away. 
Hmm. And then one thing led to another. I said, well, how do I know that this is a text about slavery? Because the word slave appears in it. And Paul says, don't treat him as a slave. Hmm. As a word, one word, as as. You know, you could, it's as, it can also be translated as if. Hmm. I thought to myself, well, this sounds quite rhetorical to me. You know, if I say, if, 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 if I'm treating, if I'm treating you poorly and you say, Alan, you know, dial it back a little bit. I mean, don't stop treating me like a slave. You're not saying that because you're a slave. Mm -hmm. You're saying it because you're not. Mm -hmm. See, you're making, you know, you're reminding me, so look, you know, Alan, you don't know me. You need to back up. So when I read the rest of the letter I'm in this way, I said, well, this doesn't, this, this doesn't, to me, this doesn't sound like we're dealing with a slave owner at all, especially based on what little I knew about slavery in the first century. And then I did some homework about that. On, on that. And I said, well, what are, are, there, are there other parallel, I mean, there are parallel texts. I mean, there are other texts that, like, that are like this. And again, if you read in the commentaries, you know, those commentaries that, that we have, um, the commentaries will point you to uh, Pliny's letter and, and you know, these other you know, kind of um, other, you know, like first century, early second century dead white elites, males, you know, that who wrote stuff. But I looked at those letters and they don't sound at all like the letter. Not at all. The rhetoric is completely different. So I started putting those things together. And so somewhere around three o'clock in the morning uh, of the day that I was to submit the paper, I decided that Philemon is not about slavery at all. Hmm. And Paul says, treat this guy like a brother. He's your brother. I said, well, these guys are brothers then. Hmm. I said, well, what if you read this text and read that these guys are brothers on the outs with each other? Huh. And Paul is making an intervention to reconcile them because, because, as, as you know, Paul wrote these letters because he couldn't be there. Right. right? And a lot of the times that he was writing, he was doing a bid, right? He was in, he was in jail. And that's yeah. why he couldn't be there. So, like, he really couldn't be there. So I said, well, so, and he says that. He says, look, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm about to get out. You know, like if you're in jail and you've been in jail for a long time, you, you know, if you if you have anybody to write to, you write to them and tell them, look, my bid's about up. I'm, I'm about to get out. Mm -hmm. So he says, look, I'm about to get out and I'm going to come to your place. That's what the letter is about, you know, and and I find several places in Paul's correspondence. What he's doing is he's he's putting the bite on people. He's asking people for stuff mm -hmm. for him. You know, he's, I'm going here, I'm going to do this, I'm going to come to see you, I hope you're going to, and in the letter, in the, this letter, it's a short letter, it's the shortest letter he's written. He says at the end, I'm coming to see you, have a room ready for me. He's going to crash there, he said, and um, I, I, I'm sending ahead my guy, Onesimus. I know you guys have a problem. He says, and then he, and he does all kinds of weird things in this very short letter. He says, I know you guys have a problem. He says, you know, but um, uh, I mean, I would, I have a right really to ask for stuff. Mm -hmm. He says, I have a right to impose on you. That's really what he says. I have a right to impose on you. Um, so uh, whatever he may owe you, and that's, I mean, you owe me a lot more. Mm -hmm. Um, so I figured, so I, I, I came up with this backstory. I said, well, this is a story about two brothers who are, and that also opened up a lot of secondary, a lot of uh, parallel literature to me, because you know, in ancient Greek, this is a major issue at the time. Brothers who are on the outs with each other, family squabbles, Seneca's writing about it, you know, all the moralists write about this. Yeah. So, you know, when you have family problems and like they were the, the, the family therapists of, of, the, of the era. So if you're a philosopher, especially brothers, because there was inheritance involved, mm. 
this is a, this is an alpha male thing. You know, you got you, the older brother, the younger brother, the inheritance. Uh, we get the flavor of this a little bit in, in uh, uh, the parable of the prodigal son and Luke. You know, it's, it's all over. It's all over uh, uh, liter Greek literature at this time. And so I had those, I had like a like half dozen parallels of that. So I took all this stuff to, to I put all this stuff in the paper. And then it came time to road test it in the seminar because you had to submit the paper the Friday before at noon, at high noon. So like the old Gary Cooper movie, you know, said, if it was late, you know, you didn't even want to think about what happened to you. you know? mm -hmm. So I don't know, but 11.55 or something like that, I submitted my paper. <laughs> and uh, so the next Wednesday comes around, and the, 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 it's the seminar. And so the, my papers, the paper for the seminar. And, um, you know, and Helmut, you know, takes the opportunity to let everybody know that I have no idea what I'm talking about. You know, just, you know, and uh, I, I went to, I went to his office, you know, and people talked about it after, it was really bizarre because nobody, see, first of all, I was the only, I was the only descendant of slaves in the room. Mm. See, yeah. that was the other thing. That was the other, that was the engine that was driving this train. You know, that, that was a, that was a letter that was used to justify slavery in this country. Yeah. It's all over the place in antebellum pro-slavery literature, mm. all over the place. Mm. And even in, in anti-slavery literature, because I found there in the 19th century a reading that was my, this is a reading that I invented, that I said, you know, this idea that they were really brothers and all of the kind of stuff. Somebody came up with that like in the 1820s or something, hmm. which makes it like every good idea I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Somebody else has already thought it up, <laughs> and so and and I, I so I saw all this stuff and this stuff too I threw in there you know I threw in my paper and this was something that was a little out of the ordinary because usually you're supposed to be quoting people from the first century or Germans from the twentieth century, mm -hmm. and these were neat. This was antebellum literature. I had to go in the library and look at all these pamphlets from the 19th century, stuff like that. It was really very interesting. I learned a lot. But this was the stuff that usually didn't show up in our New Testament seminar. Mm -hmm. And I went to Helmut's office afterwards, you know, after I got obscured in, in, uh, in seminar. And I said, uh, Helmut, um, because I still was kind of slow on the uptake, and I still hadn't really put this together. I said, Helmut, you know, I'm, um, I'm thinking of proposing this from, as a dissertation topic. And he said, well, forget it. Mm -hmm. I remember he said, put that in a drawer somewhere and leave that. You can't do anything with that. He said, that's just, he said, and, I, and he said something very interesting to me that, that was a great encouragement to me as I was just about to leave his office in search to the li in, in route to the library to search for another dissertation topic, mm -hmm. right? He said, even if you're right about this, he said, no one's ever going to believe this. Huh. That's how he ended the conversation. That's all I needed. <laughs> That's all I needed. It was the first book I wrote. Huh. It was the first, it was a little book about that letter. It was the first book that I published. Helmet helped me to find a publisher for it. Really? He did. I, 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 give, I, I, he's, I give him full credit for that. He he greased the skids for the publication of that book, mm -hmm. even though he didn't agree with me at all and didn't believe a word of anything I said. Anymore. He didn't, he completely disagreed with me because I was disagreeing with, I learned later, because I looked at the history of interpretation. Martin Luther had treated this text already the way everybody else had, mm -hmm. case closed. Mm -hmm. So I had to be wrong, I mean, by definition. There was really no reason for Helmut to reconsider the interpretation at all. Uh, Luther had resolved this issue for, you know, four centuries ago, and that, that was that. Five, really. That was that. And uh, I, I thought one of the, one of the uh, questions I had, you know, after this experience with uh, dealing with this letter, you know, just to Philemon and trying to figure that out, and trying to figure myself out along the way, and said, well, I mean, why is this such a big deal to me? And why, you know, the helmet told me to leave it alone, put it away, get rid of it. But I never 
did. I never kind of, I never got over it. Mm -hmm. you know? I'm still not over it. You see? Mm -hmm. I said, well, what's that all about? Well, because I'm a descendant of slaves. Mm -hmm. you see? And uh, so slavery is, um, is a big issue for me, not simply because not it, it's uh, part of my history. Well, it's a part of all of our history. You see, yeah. it's just that where, where the question is when and where you enter, but um, that's a part of com our common history. But uh, for me, I mean, it's a history that is that has you know that, that has left a mark on me in a certain way. And um, when I thought about when I would read these texts, these patristic texts, I would think to myself, well. Um, I know in my community, the Bible has been a big deal historically. It shaped our language. Um, if you look around in the culture, it's all over the place. I talk with you about this in the book. It's all over the place. It's not just in church. Right? So of course, it, it dominates church discourse, but um, uh, it, it, it's in music, it's in, it's in art, it's in literature, it's in... Um, you, if, if you don't know something about the Bible, it's hard to read James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. See, it's, it's just hard to even even titles, phrases. <laughs> You're just so much better off if you know something about the Bible if you're reading. Now, I called the the the, the book that I wrote the talking book. There is a uh, a scene that I encountered in several places in um, African-American slave autobiographies and accounts of slaves. He would, he would hold it to his ear to hear, what the, to hear the book talk. Hmm. There was one guy who did this in his, in his autobiography. He, he describes this. He said, he went and his master would, would, talk, would, would, uh, would read from this book. The book would talk to his master. That's how he understood it. So late one evening, he, he, he again, you know, on, on the QT, he, was, he snuck out, he, he found his Bible, found his book, and he held it to his ear, he said, and he said, and the book refused to talk to me. It despised me because I was black. Mm. And so I decided to, uh, you know, give the book, my book, that title, book about a book <laughs> by the son of a librarian, you know. Uh, I decided to give that, uh, give the book that title, you know, in, in um, recognition of that trope. Um, and then how I actually hear it. This didn't, this didn't come out so much in the book, but it has come to be a very important part of how I deal with the Bible. And that is that, after all, the Bible is a book. See, we have to make it talk. Of course. We have to give it voice because it's a book. Books don't talk. They have marks in them, and we interpret those marks, and that's how we derive meaning from them. Mm -hmm. And what that uh, suggests to me is that whatever reading we get out of it is our responsibility. See, no one can say, well, the Bible says that, and, you know, you just have to suck it up. Well, no, I don't. I mean, you're saying it, whoever you are. Um, and uh, um, there's no, I don't see any compelling reason why I need to suck it up because you're saying it. Now, you, you, you've, what you found in the Bible is, uh, you know, a narrative or a discourse or imagery that you've used to articulate something that you that you that you've seen or something that you are you're asserting something that you're arguing okay and my sense is that every my conclusion the conclusion the conviction really um is that everyone deals with the bible that way not everyone admits to that but that's how everyone deals with the bible mm -hmm. we have to take responsibility for our reading mm -hmm. so if i read something and um it's, it deserves you. Let's say I read something, it's hurtful for you. Let's say I read something that, that um, detracts in some way from you as a human being. 
uh, and you say, Alan, you, you hurt me with that, you know, the way you, you, you're dealing with that text, you, you're hurting me with that. And I, I would say, well, look, you know, Rick, I mean, it's, it's there in the Bible. I didn't write it. I'm just, re well, you, you, you'd be within your rights to say, no, Alan, it, what's in the Bible is in the Bible. If it had stayed in there, it wouldn't have hurt me. <laughs> it hurt me because, <laughs> because of what you did. You brought it out. So you, you know, that's, that's on you. That's something you did. So, uh, you know, as, a, as, a, as an interpreter, as a preacher, however I use this text, I, I have to own that. So, I mean, I've learned to think, to try at least to, to make the effort to think twice about what I'm doing because, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's um, as, as uh, you know, I have a chapter in a book entitled The Poison Book. Mm -hmm. you know, Elijah Muhammad, you know, the leader of the nation of Islam, he said, the Bible is a poison book. Mm -hmm. so Why? Because he knew there was a lot of stuff in it that was used against his people mm -hmm. to hurt them. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, it's one thing for, for something to be poisonous. It's another thing for me to put that poison in your food. Mm, right. See, and you can, and somebody, and I, and, and so you eat the food, you get sick, you, you, you barely survive. You say, wow, Al, you know, you, you gave me this food. It almost killed me. I said, well, you, 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 Alan, you're, you're, that's attempted murder. You know, you know, hopefully you, you, somebody takes you to task for that and you don't, you can't hire Dershowitz to get you off. I said, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't do anything to you. It was the poison that did it. Mm. <laughs> That's not a defense. Right. See, uh, so, and as, so as someone who, who does a lot with this text, really that's all I'm competent to do. I mean, that's all I know mm. how to do. Mm. Uh, of all people, I, I have to exercise a lot of care in doing that, especially since I know a lot of people have been hurt, mm. by the way. The, by the yeah. poison in, the, in, the, in this text. Yeah. So the Bible can be weaponized. Uh, yeah, that's a, yes, that's an excellent way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and not, not only, unfortunately, it's, it's not just a possibility. I mean, this is, this is our reality. I mm -hmm. think people, for people who interpret the Bible and people who handle the Bible, they need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. You know, that this, uh, this thing needs a warning label on it. What do you say then for the, the layperson Bible teacher who, um, you know, they don't ever anticipate probably having a theological course. Unfortunately, what they may do is go to YouTube and, and just look for somebody that's saying something and it might be kind of, uh, just wrong. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the, I think that's the most charitable way you could put it. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you suggest? What do you suggest for, for lay people who are non-professional Bible teachers? Uh, how can they f find resources, uh, find education that, that gives them a, a good perspective good interpretation that they can bring to their class? That's an excellent question. So I think that, 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 that some stuff you find, some stuff will find you. And then you, um, then there are people out there, as you know, I mean, you're, you're interviewing mm -hmm. um, people. You, you've made this your mission, right? To interview people who at least have the promise of being able to help people who want to handle this text mm -hmm. uh, and not hurt people. Mm -hmm. Presumably, I mean, I think, I think the people who are tuning into what you're doing, there's, they, they have a concern. And they're like, well, yeah, I want to handle this. Uh, I want to rightly divide it or however they may put it. Uh, and that means people being better off after you said what you said, done what you've done than they were before. Um, you know, that, that, uh, They've, um, they've heard something that they didn't know before. Mm. 
that they've seen something that they didn't, they hadn't seen before. That's another thing. I think maybe not so much for everybody who attends a Bible study, but certainly for people who need it. Mm -hmm. It, our minds are such that it doesn't hurt them to encounter perspectives that are different. Mm -hmm. Right. You, 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 your, your, you know, your brain is actually built to accommodate that. It actually kind of wrinkles up a little bit so you can put more stuff in it. So um, even though apparently there are a lot of people out there, uh, I'm judging by the way that they behave, are afraid to do that. They think they may break something in there. Mm. It, it's, it's not made that way, precisely contrary. It's really better off folding up to accommodate new information. And then you, you, as a Bible study teacher, you, you sift through that stuff. Of course, with your perspective. Of course, they're going to get your perspective. They're coming from your perspective. They trust you. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they shouldn't, but they, they do. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, 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 you sift through that and you give them that. that that's, that's the intellectual work that you do. Mm -hmm. It's a labor of love. And they take it and they do what they will. Mm -hmm. But if they're, if, if they're good at that, then uh, it's okay because um, they know how to deal with the kind of people who come to Bible study. Mm -hmm. right? That's a mixed multitude. Mm -hmm. you know, there's some intellectuals in there. There's some heretics in there. Uh, there's some very devout people who are coming to see if you're going to repeat to them what it is they already know, mm -hmm. it, it is it's really a mixed multitude. Of people. And uh, but that's okay because if 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 that mixture is properly managed, it can still be very good for everybody. I'd like to thank Alan Callahan for his time and expertise that he shared with us today. A couple of takeaways for me. One was the challenge to go outside the box in our interpretation of scriptures as he did in his work on the book of Philemon. Another though, is the heavy responsibility that we have as biblical teachers and interpreters. The Bible can be used as a weapon. The Bible can be used to harm people. My prayer, of course, is that we will use the Bible to help and not harm those who are in need. If you have enjoyed this interview, I hope you'll look back on the website, greatbibleteachers.com, and look at other interviews that I've had with other scholars and authors and practitioners. And you can sign up for the e-news. You'll get two e-news letters, one on Tuesday, to let you know about the new blog that has come out on the website, greatbibleteachers.com. And then on Thursday, you'll get notification of the interview of that week. So I hope that you'll sign up for that so you'll be aware and join us. If you have comments or questions, of course, you can leave them with me at greatbibleteachers.com or send them to me at drrick, dr dot R -I -C -K, at greatbibleteachers.com. Thank you again for joining us this week.